moving on, I just want to uh, thank all of the members of FLYA. We have the greatest members in the entire world, and we appreciate you very much. Without your support, we wouldn't have been able to make this happen. Our event sponsors today, uh, Nationwide, um, Prequin, Boomerang Capital, S&P Global Market Intelligence, Safe Harbor Equity, the Mortgage Office, Harvest Volatility Management, Millennium Trust, the Apex One Investment Partners, and Trust Global, Off the Chain Capital, Clarion Asset Management. With your help, we've made this event possible. It's a, a five-part series, and uh, it has not been easy, and it's been very much needed. Investors globally are tuning in. Uh, we had very, very uh, strong uh, support. Uh, that support has been growing. The amount of people attending has been growing, and you know this would not have been possible without uh, your, your financial support, your guidance, uh, your participation, and we want to especially thank all the attendees, the people that are new, the people that are coming back. We, we appreciate it very much. We know that your time is valuable. We want to provide you with the most up-to-date uh, insights and clarity from people that are on the front lines doing uh, deals, structuring things, uh, putting together projects, and, um, you know, these are challenging times. The conversation's unfolding. You can rely on us to provide you with the best up-to-date information that's going on inside of this, this, this space, which happens to be the, the largest and fastest growing space inside of alternative investments. Okay, with that said, we're going to skip through uh, most of the stuff. However, I wanted to bring everyone's attention to uh, our upcoming educational webcasts from our members. Uh, they're coming up. Uh, we will be announcing them to you. Um, if you haven't registered on the Flyer platform, please, uh, you know, register. Uh, my team will send a, a link through the chat uh, function, and I suggest that you you sign up and you let register. Um, so, with that said, I have a dear friend of mine, Amanda from Prime Alpha. She's a CEO and founder. Amanda is going to be leading today's uh, panel: special situations post COVID nineteen. Uh, NPLs, uh, distressed opportunities, super important topic. We got an excellent panel. Amanda, thank you very much for doing us, uh, doing this for us today. I'm going to turn this over to you now. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, so this is a, a pretty broad topic. So, um, so I wanted to narrow down our focus for this discussion and, and really take a journey from a macro view and then hone in on where the opportunities lay. Um, what to look out for, and how can investors participate. And then we'll leave about, um, I think now 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, and so uh, we'll do that. And, I, and thanks again, Michael, for, and Faya for inviting me to moderate. This is my second time doing so. Um, and really excited to moderate this great panel of real estate specialists. Um, so let's uh, just kick it off with some short introductions and uh, I'll start first. Uh, so I am, as Michael mentioned, the CEO of Prime Alpha. We are a tech enabled platform helping alternative managers and investors connect. Um, our mission is to promote and educate on quality alternative products and expand its reach. Uh, we work with about uh, 1,000 alternative funds across all strategies, including real estate. And, and what we really do is help alternative investors source niche and differentiated opportunities in a non-biased way. Um, a simple way to visualize what is Prime Alpha is to think about um, this intersection between LinkedIn, eHarmony, and Cap Intro. So um, at this time, I'll, I would like to turn this over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves. And we'll start with uh, Adrian. Yes, hi, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you for making the time to be here. And a special thanks uh, well, to, to Amanda and uh, from uh, Michael and Jeff from uh, Flya, who spearheaded this event for uh, thousands of viewers these past couple of days. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you guys. Um, my name is Adrian Leon Crespo and I'm a financial advisor for uh, ultra high net worth individuals and institutions. I joined Alvarium, formerly Guggenheim Partners Latin America, in 2013, where I played a senior role in portfolio management division. I carry over 12 years experience and a natural passion for consulting, trading, and asset management. Um, prior to Guggenheim, I practiced these skills as portfolio manager for the Bryant University Endowment. And here's where I studied finance and economics. And uh, more recently, I'm a current member of the CFA Society and a charter holder. 
Um, in regards to the company that I chose to make my career in, career in Alverium, uh, something quick about it is, uh, is it stood out given its legacy, values, and professionalism. Um, like I said, uh, formerly Guggenheim Partners Latam is an investment, uh, registered investment advisor, uh, registered with the SEC. We have our office here in Miami um, and through our affiliates in cities such as London, Geneva, Paris, Hong Kong. Um, the group is able to deliver that full-fledged multifamily office service, uh, providing solutions for families, foundations, and institutions across the world. And uh, last but not least, um, in terms of the philosophy, uh, we've been able to match uh, independent investment advice, uh, sometimes with exclusive access to direct and co-investment opportunities, uh, thus generating that outperformance for clients, partners, and shareholders. Uh, as a trusted advisors on financial markets, we look for ideas usually outside traditional assets. Uh, and that's why you're in this, in this panel. And the focus is, uh, is that for our clients, uh, given their uh, suitability and their profiles is more on alternatives. Uh, we have over 220 employees, a group of Arium as a group whole with its affiliates is uh, yeah, 220 employees. And uh, we all, uh, groups oversees 18 billion in, in assets. Um, thank you, Amanda. All right, we'll say uh, Brian. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Prenovo. I work at Safe Harbor Equity. We are a private equity firm that invests in distressed commercial real estate debt. Uh, we don't buy the, you know, the underlying assets outright. Uh, we just purchase the debt. We work with the borrowers to either refinance the debt, perform some type of workout, or if necessary, perform a uh, or, or pursue a foreclosure and take title of the underlying collateral. Uh, we have been in business since 2015, uh, although our general partner has been doing this type of investing since about 2005. Uh, but you know, we have launched three funds. Uh, our first one is about liquidated. Our second one is in the wind down phase, and our third fund, which was launched last year with an eye on um, you know, some potential opportunities and, and we thought perhaps there might be a market correction in late 2019 or early 2020. We obviously had no idea that this type of economic upheaval would uh, kind of present itself to us, but uh, you know, here we are. So that's, that's what we do. Like I said, we, we invest only in the commercial real estate debt. Um, you know, we are not portfolio managers in, in the sense that we, we do not look to acquire the underlying asset within with an eye to building a portfolio of units or square footage to then operate. You know, we look to uh, either sell that debt or, or sell the underlying collateral after we take title as soon as possible. But we've uh, proven to be fairly successful with those three funds and we're looking at the opportunities that present themselves now. Karen. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Karen and I'm the managing partner of Pikes Peak Capital. My business partner and I founded Pikes Peak Capital in 2017 as a distressed, opportunistic private equity company. Our funds purchased deeply discounted residential assets from banks and bulk sellers and resell them near market value to local investors or owner occupants. We currently manage about three funds and in 2020 anticipate buying and selling between 500 and 1,000 assets per year. Um, personally, I also have a background in marketing policy and community development before my private equity days. So I, I think I have a particular ability to understand and relate to the, the end consumer of our homes. And, and Rick? Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> and thank you, Flya, for, for inviting me to participate today. My name is Rick Sharga. Um, I, I run a consulting practice called CJ Patrick Company. Uh, where I work with real estate, mortgage, and technology companies on their business strategies and their and their market and marketing strategies. Uh, I've been in the real estate and mortgage business for about 20 years now. Uh, uh, stints with uh, companies like Realty Track, uh, Auction.com, and 10X, and Carrington Mortgage Holdings, and uh, and delighted to be part of today's panel. Great, oh. great, thank you. Um, 
Can you guys hear me? Sorry, I've, I've been muting enough. <laughs> okay, um, great. So let's let's great. So let's move over to the the macro view. So I'm going to point this to Adrian. Um, it, it'd be great if you can give us your assessment on the current um, real estate environment on a broader sense. And I think one of the questions that um, you know we all get is how does this time around compare to um, the 2008 financial crisis? Perfect, perfect. Um, thank you, Amanda. So um, to begin from a macro perspective, what we're seeing is that uh, currently uh, the, the wartime fiscal deficits, particularly in the U.S., combined with a zero interest rates is a textbook example to me as, uh, as well, um, more money supply combined with that free credit and essentially a lower discounting rate, which by definition increased this asset value. So a textbook example of, of this combination that we're seeing. Uh, money as represented by M2. Um, this has broad money supply has increased 20% year over year. Uh, it's the largest increase in, in the lifetime of many. It's about 3 trillion since December. Um, and another interesting fact coupled with this is uh, retail trades uh, as represented by TD and E-Trade. Uh, have averaged or used to average uh, about 1 million and now stand at 3 million uh, just for these brokers. Uh, and it illustrates the point of cash of that uh, excess broad money supply, uh, stimulus checks, uh, chasing assets. Um, this, I think, is exemplified by the 50 day rally in the stock market uh, that began in the March bottom. It was the fastest rally in nine decades. And uh, if this is a sign of things to come, and uh, usually the stock market is a good leading indicator, then it's uh, very likely that real estate is also poised to benefit. Um, real estate obviously is a less liquid investment, thus uh, adjustments will take longer. However, um, just as we're seeing corporate defaults, mortgage defaults uh, should soon follow, especially as government eases on forbearance support. Uh, I think this is from usually, it was three months to six months, and they've extended it to, I think, six to 12 months. Uh, so um, defaults are probably going to start leaking after that. Um, and then once, though, once the system processes these events, uh, the stimulative macro outlook should help uh, push uh, this asset type up, um, as was the case in liquid markets. Um, and this, again, is supported by uh, timeless knowledge of Adam Smith, uh, the inverse relation of real estate and interest rates. Now, with uh, rock bottom rates, uh, that that that's, should help uh, these assets, uh, many assets. Uh, in regards to differences, Amanda, what you mentioned from today in 2008, <clears throat> The, you can say that the, the, the tune rhymes, but the song is different. Uh, this is a biological crisis, uh, which will receive uh, and, and will be fixed by a biological solution from the medical community in due time. Uh, and the me economic damage, um, which uh, BlackRock cited in, in one of their pieces, uh, is expected to be 10 to 15 percent of GDP with spillover effects. But this should be more than compensated by fiscal and central bank measures. Uh, which amount to 25% of GDP. So uh, I recall in, in 2008, 2009, I was uh, in college, I was watching the news, the crisis unfold and uh, how trillions were being discussed to be released over uh, a few years. And it was mem mesmerizing how uh, markets followed. Uh, and this time I remember clearly in March seeing how three trillion or, or trillions were, were being injected in a matter of months. Uh, was mind blowing, and uh, this could only be done. And the difference uh, from 2008 was this was a natural disaster. Those less political stigma was attached to general bailouts. Um, and uh, lastly, is uh, we received this crisis with a much more sound financial sector. It's tightly regulated, overcapitalized, which uh, should allow for a more robust, uh, maybe what we're saying, a V-shaped recovery, even though recontagion risk uh, is, uh, is, is a risk to the scenario, even though we're now better informed and prepared. Very interesting. Um, so thank you for that um, macro view. Um, super interesting. Um, so I, I think I'd like to, at this point, to delve in a little bit um, in terms of um, the fact that we have Brian and Karin with us who are experts in their fields. Um, and I'd love to get Brian to, to address um, what's happening on the commercial space and, and Karin on the residential space. So first, Brian, can you walk us through the state of the commercial, uh, commercial real estate touching on non-performing mortgages and what's going on there? 
Sure. Um, the way we look at it is, you know, commercial real estate is a very broad term and that uh, encompasses a lot of different asset classes or, or sub asset classes. So when you're looking at commercial real estate, the, the state of the market kind of varies by asset class. So something like hospitality has, has really taken a really, you know, significant hit uh, and they're really hurting. Something like industrial is probably had less of a hit um, in the current environment. And then you look at other asset classes like multifamily or retail or office, um, which, which typically, you know, office is something that you would typically say is, is would be relatively healthy even in an economic crisis. But I think the nature of this economic crisis and the fact that so many businesses have been forced to a work at home type situation for many of its employees, there, that has a potential to really significantly alter the long term landscape of people's or companies business models and therefore reassess their needs for office space. Uh, so they're probably a little bit more at risk. Uh, you know, today than, than we might have seen in, in previous economic crises. And then something like retail is, I, I think, an example of where a crisis doesn't necessarily create uh, cracks in a business model. It merely shows them or exacerbates them. Uh, so we do think that, that you know, retail overall uh, is, is probably going to, is hurting more than some other asset classes. So how that relates to, you know, the non-performing distressed debt market is that, you know, the crisis happens and now there is the, there's a natural timeline that it has to walk through before that debt, you know, moves from performing to merely late to the non accrual and then becomes a TDR. So there is a process that happens over the course of 60 to 90 to 120 days for that debt to kind of, like I said, work through the process and become truly distressed. As Adrian said, you know, easing of forbearance over the next 60 to 90 days, where we're going to really see uh, the full impact of what happened in April, May, you know, the end of March, early June, uh, that's going to work itself out through, you know, the end of July, August, and into September, where we're really going to start to see uh, the true nature and the true availability of distressed debt. So Karen, um, can you address the residential real estate segment um, and what is the market outlook for distressed opportunistic single family notes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'd say the short answer is that distressed residential real estate opportunities are already here um, and they'll likely last for several years to come. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean about that. When COVID-19 first really started hitting the markets in March, many traditional non-QM lenders fled the market and a lot of the usual buyers sat on the sidelines. So our funds were actually able to pick up vacant REO assets at about 50% of what we normally purchase them. Uh, we were able to purchase them at, at those discounts in April. We also saw uh, at that time, other anomalies in the market, kind of distressed uh, warehouse lines and fix and flip loans, that, that the market was um, just suddenly kind of leaving in a, out stranded. But the market started returning to its previous levels in May, so that was sort of a short-term arbitrage opportunity. Right now, we are starting to see significant discounts on some occupied REO assets especially in markets like the Northeast in California that have ill-defined end dates to eviction moratoriums, such as moratoriums that state that you can start an eviction proceeding 90 days after the state of emergency ends. Well, when's the state of emergency gonna end? Nobody knows. So these assets are pretty discounted right now. We're also seeing a slight uptick in vacant REO assets and NPL in general. I think that's because sellers are looking to make space on their balance sheets for what they view as, as maybe a tsunami of foreclosures in the next year. Now, looking forward, I would say that employment is really the fulcrum that all else pivots on. Um, employment, uh, unemployment was originally expected to be temporary in the form of furloughs and layoffs, but that's now shaping up to be more permanent. Uh, than, than was originally expected. 
So, um, you know, the CARES Act allows borrowers with federally backed mortgages to request up to 280 day forbearance periods, but there's no regulation like this for private lenders. Instead, private lenders are generally extending some sort of forbearance to borrowers, but not all of them are tacking those payments onto the back of the loan. And besides, CARES Act forbearance isn't a permanent solution. It's like a snooze button for mortgages. Um, but in early May, Fannie Mae indicated that the percentage of all loans in forbearance could rise up to 15% in 2020. Um, so what does this mean for residential distressed opportunistic uh, notes? First, um, we're seeing you know, these opportunities come across our desk now, especially as I mentioned, the occupied REO and NPL. And then we anticipate an uptick next in performing loans in the next three to six months, especially as private lenders begin moving those loans through loss mitigation and then foreclosure. Um, then finally, we anticipate that the federally backed mortgages will take more time, let's say nine to 12 months to begin really moving through the loan default and foreclosure closure process. But if unemployment remains at 9% until the end of the year, as Fed Chair Jerome Powell believes, then this deal flow will probably last for years to come. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Rick, from, from a wider lens perspective as a real estate consultant, I mean, we, we touched on commercial, residential, you know, are, are there any other real estate segments um, that we should be thinking about in comparison? And are there any specific geographic trends that, uh, that we should be watching out for? Always helps if you unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> so those, those are great questions. And I think Brian and, and Karin covered a, a lot of things. I'm, I'm personally more concerned about the commercial real estate market. Um, uh, and how it fares that I am the residential. There's been a lot of money uh, and effort thrown at the um, at the residential uh, market with the forbearance programs and some of the other uh, some of the other stimulus that's been been out there. Uh, I, I agree with Brian that I think retail and hospitality are probably the two uh, most vulnerable sectors of the um, of the commercial market. Uh, and, and ironically, I think some of the bigger cities, some of the bigger urban areas are probably areas where we'll see some of the earlier uh, stages of distress uh, as, as people uh, are at least anecdotally starting to, to kind of flee for the suburbs uh, where, where they're not gonna be locked in a 700 square foot apartment for three months. Uh, and there's a perception that, uh, that perhaps uh, the lifestyles are healthier. Um, I think long-term you're gonna have some interesting opportunities in the office uh, sector. I think we might be looking at some foundational changes, both in the form of a distributed workforce, uh, more people working from home, and more companies taking a look uh, at, at moving some of their workforce into lower priced um, uh, second and third tier markets. Uh, now that they know that a remote workforce can actually uh, remain highly productive at a lower cost. Um, and I, I, I think there's gonna be some short term disruption in the multifamily space. I'm not sure if that's going to be in large professionally managed apartments uh, or more of the mom and pop variety. Uh, there are all sorts of varying claims out there in terms of, of the, the percentage of delayed payments uh, among renters. Uh, but because of the eviction moratoria that are, are active in, in a lot of high population states, uh, California, New York uh, among them, um, there, there's a, a likelihood that we're going to see delayed or, or skipped payments by a lot of renters. And it'll be interesting to see which landlords have the financial wherewithal to, to get through that. There's actually a lawsuit being filed by a group of landlords in California uh, questioning the state's authority to prevent them from uh, collecting rent and, and evicting tenants. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the residential side, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm a little more bullish than Karin is. Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is as bad as the headline numbers are, and they are uh, indisputably awful, um, the, the home ownership rate among the people that are, are, have lost their jobs at this point is actually relatively low. Um, if, you, if you look at U.S. Census Bureau numbers, you take a look at um, 
home ownership rates, uh, the the rates of home ownership for people households below the the, the median income level is about fifty percent or lower. Uh, it's even lower among households headed by by younger people and people with less than a college education. Uh, on the other hand, uh, home ownership rates for for households with above median income is over eighty percent. The the job losses have um, been skewed very, very heavily towards service industries. You're talking about retail trades, restaurants, hospitality, travel, tourism, entertainment. These, these traditionally are markets populated by employees who are low wage uh, hourly earners and have very, very low home ownership rates. So the, the first wave of job losses, as, as significant as they've been, uh, has been very, very heavily skewed toward renters, not homeowners, or not, not the pool of potential homeowners. And in fact, we've seen incredibly strong demand in terms of pending sales, new home sales, and purchase loan applications uh, as, as local economies have opened up. So I'm, I'm not completely Pollyannish. Um, uh, we, we will definitely see an increase in, in the levels of default. Um, I don't think we're looking at another tsunami like we saw in 2008 for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which is that even with the number of people in the forbearance program, uh, we're, we're, we're actually looking at, depending on whose numbers you, you believe, either two consecutive weeks of less people in forbearance or at least uh, a week over week decline according to the Mortgage Bankers Association. So looks like we peaked at about eight and a half percent. And according to a survey done by LendingTree, about 70% of those people opted into the forbearance program uh, because uh, they wanted to hedge their bets just in case something happened. But we've had over 20% of the people in forbearance continue to make their mortgage payments, even though they don't have to. So that, that to me is an indicator that, that uh, the market was very strong going in, the loan quality was very good. I believe we will see NPL availability sooner than we will see asset availability in the residential side. I don't think we're gonna see REOs in any meaningful numbers for probably 12 to 18 months because of forbearance, because of state guidelines, uh, and, and candidly, because of the rules that were put in place after the last foreclosure crisis, which extend the process. Uh, but I, I do think we're gonna probably start to see NPLs as soon as the forbearance programs uh, are, are, are allowed to sunset, and that could be in the next uh, six to 12 months. Great. Um Fantastic. That's it's, that's great. Um, so um, we we're lucky to have Adrian with us because he he speaks to a lot of ultra high net worths, family offices, institutions, and and providing that investors uh, perspective on the demand side. Um, so Adrian, what 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 are what areas are your clients attracted to? You know, what are li they looking for, and and do they feel like there are deals right now? Mm, great. Um, thank you, Amanda. Uh, in regards to uh, what we're seeing uh, demand for, I guess my answer is a two-part question. Is a two is in two parts, and this is given um, the swift changes brought by COVID and uh, its altered appetite. How it's altered appetites in uh, recent times. Uh, prior to 2020, um, we were extremely focused on private debt, particularly in the asset back by a, a real estate, uh, private debt that is particularly backed by tangible real estate collateral. Um, this was especially true given the, the late stages of this business cycle we were in. Uh, we're seeing uh, some excesses in um, building in the system, the yield curve flattening and uh, and so being on the debt side of capital structure seemed more prudent as compared to the equity side. So this, uh, like I said, was prior to 2020. Um, and as you can see, I wanted to make a quick reference to, uh, to, to, to the slide that, that we're showing. Um, so this is just a difference between top quartile managers and uh, average managers in each of the um, of, of different asset, assets or sectors. And you, as you can see in, in liquid public markets, the difference from a top manager and an average manager is about one and a half, two percent in fixed income, even less, no less alpha to add a more <clears throat> informationally efficient markets. But in um, in alternatives, uh, in private debt, for example, the difference is three or in, in private equity, it can be from seven to nine. So there's a lot more uh, substantial value to add, uh, giving access to these top uh, top quartile managers. And um, 
to this point, uh, for example, uh, what we're doing prior to COVID, as an illustrative reference, in November of last year, uh, with our affiliate in New Zealand, we closed the largest uh, private real estate transaction in the country's history. Um, this unique private debt opportunity was fully backed uh, by about 500 million uh, New Zealand dollars in, in appraised and tangible collateral, which your clients usually feel comfortable with, you know, with real estate. And uh, moreover, um, uh, the concept was uh, quite simple and, and straightforward. Uh, people can relate to as it was essentially purchasing assets at a wholesale price, uh, given our volume, our economies of scale, and then selling them in a in smaller pieces uh, at higher retail prices. That was what the, the, our affiliate group in New Zealand did. Uh, this was spearheaded by Andrew William. He is the ex-chairman uh, ex of Cushman Wakefield. He now lives in, in New Zealand, actually. Um, and that's how this, this opportunity came to be. Uh, and, in, and through this uh, opportunity, um, this, our affiliates were, gave our clients uh, access to a 20% fixed return, uh, which is much higher than than anything we're seeing in, in liquid markets, you know. And uh, it was short. It was short. That's what we also liked. Was three years. Um, so, like I said, in a low yielding environment, this works. And this is especially true for ultra high net worth clients or institutions that don't need all their capital tied up to, in, or don't need all their capital liquid, and they can tie it up in a, into more illiquid uh, investments and and receive that illiquidity premium. Uh, just for being more patient. Um, and to, to your question that the second part, I guess it was a two part answer, is post COVID and uh, post COVID given the dislocations and discounts, uh, we are now, now seeing, um, sorry, the, the line got a bit disconnected. So yes, given the, dis the discounts and dislocations we're now seeing post COVID, uh, we're seeing greater value now in more the private equity side and the, yeah, the equity side, and this can be seen in real estate and venture capital. Uh, specifically, another example uh, of our affiliates, um, they're granting access to a top quartile specialist in Germany with over $2 billion in transaction experience. Uh, they had built the Mercedes-Benz Arena, the Soho House in Berlin. And uh, through this uh, partnership, we're able to give clients uh, this, this access to a smaller deal, 118 million euro real estate asset. And uh, it was underwritten with a base return of 21% net IRR two times cash on cash and uh, yeah, four year, which again is a little shorter than, than usual private uh, or alternative investments. And uh, last but not least, and through the, um, through the groups, uh, our affiliate merchant banking arm, um, I know the panel, um, there's a lot of, uh, or not the panel, sorry, the audience, uh, about a third of the audience mentioned the interest in internet and communication sector and then not going into too much detail here, but, um, and the merchant banking arm kind of addresses that interest, that demand that we're seeing from the audience itself and from our clients. And um, through uh, Alvarium's relation with Silicon Valley Bank, um, we're able to, to access some of their top quartile funds. And uh, naturally, this is in through uh, their venture, venture capital funds and, uh, and and something that we noticed was giving the depressed starting points and usually vintages uh, venture capital vintages or equity vintages from um, from years of crises uh, the future returns are much higher so that's a little bit on the, the, the what we're seeing a two-sided pre and now post okay great thank you um, so I'll leave this uh, I think this is an interesting question because um, you know, obviously, there's definitely opportunities out there, um, but it's this idea of, <clears throat> from an investor's perspective, you know, not only what segments, you know, wh what which ones are going to be the winners and the losers, but in terms of timing, you know, there's been this. Um, some people have been waiting and see game. Um, some people are jumping in. Um, so timing, segmentation, and also in terms of uh, conversation around whether they should participate from a, as a debt investor or an equity. Um, so I'd love to ask um, kind of Rick, uh, Karen, Brian, if, if you um, have a specific um, viewpoint on that. I'm gonna defer, this is Rick, I'm gonna defer to Karen and Brian on, on some of the specific debt versus equity plays mm -hmm. because that, that's what they do for a living. Um, 
But briefly, uh, I would say I, I, I just yesterday got a report from First American Data Tree uh, on their their Q1, uh, the final Q1 tallies for for commercial real estate transactions, and and it appears we're already starting to see some discounting uh, in in every sector except multifamily. Uh, they looked at at both quarter over quarter and year over year. Um, uh, drops in in deal price and in deal flow, so retail uh, retail and hospitality probably took the two biggest hits, and, and I would say if you're looking at at those kinds of sectors, um, the the opportunity is going to be probably more um, uh, more elevated in the limited service hotel uh, category. I, I can tell you from my days at 10x that we sold a ton of those hotels to small investors who may not have the financial wherewithal to survive the downturn. Uh, I'm not sure Marriott and Hyatt are gonna go away anytime soon, uh, but, but that, that tier of smaller investors who, who buy a handful of, of limited service hotels may be, may be really stretched to the limits financially. Um, on the residential side, uh, if you're just looking at traditional residential sales, there's more demand than there is supply right now. So we're actually seeing prices continue to go up on traditional assets. Um, there are probably gonna be some opportunities um, in, in the distressed side of things. Uh, Karn mentioned earlier uh, the, the discount she was getting on REO assets. And I, I do think you'll see some aged REO assets be, be put out to, to market uh, at, at pretty significant uh, price reductions. And, and I think you're also gonna to continue to see some, um, I, I'm not gonna call it pa panic selling exactly, uh, but for um, for in the secondary markets in the capital markets where you have either pools or portfolios of whole loans uh, or securities that are based on some of the riskier assets, um, I, I, I do think you're going to see some discounted uh, sales opportunities in in those areas. Uh, but but in terms of in terms of commercial, I think you have to understand your local markets. Uh, and, and take a look at what's still scheduled to come out onto market in terms of new construction uh, and, and take a look at that in, in, in conjunction with what you're seeing in the local economy. What are, what's job creation look like? What do job losses look like? Um, how, how successful are those markets at reopening? And the longer it takes to reopen and the longer restaurants are being asked to run 25 and 50% capacity, uh, the more buying opportunities are going to be popping up, both in, in terms of the collateral itself uh, or the debt that, 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 that backs that collateral. Uh, and with that, I'd probably uh, defer to Brian and, and uh, Karin to, to get into more specifics. Yeah. So Karin, Brian, would you like to talk about the, the debt equity position uh, opportunities or the comparison? Yeah, um, yeah, this is Karin. I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that. Um, this is a really great question. I think um, our funds have always been focused on on equity um, because the distressed space is inherently more volatile. It's perceived as more volatile, um, and and so to be conservative for our investors and and to make sure that there aren't so many surprises, we've started off. Um, with just pure pure equity funds um and we've been able to collectively deliver about 15 percent irr on levered um and so our investors have been pretty happy with that and in some cases they they've sort of expressed that especially right now in today's market as being something that's very appealing to them about a lot of our opportunities now that's not to say that we wouldn't um consider layer on, on debt, we are looking at, at some, uh, picking up some pools of, of larger uh, NPL. And in those cases, we, we would definitely be willing to uh, layer on some debt as well. But um, I think if I were an investor right now looking at opportunities, I, I personally, just being a little bit more risk averse, despite being literally in the distress space, I would be leaning a little bit more toward equity right now. Brian? Yeah, that's interesting. So obviously we um, only do debt. Um, and I think that's because in the commercial real estate space, 
there is, uh, across different asset classes, there is a different level of underlying business um, to that type of commercial real estate that where, where the risk profile varies significantly. Uh, so as an example, hospitality is at the high end of that, where if you own a hotel, you have a significant underlying business to operate versus an industrial property, you have a, a relatively low uh, or, or almost no underlying business. So, you, you know, you have to be, you have to understand what that underlying business is and whether or not that is in your wheelhouse, whether or not you're good at doing that. Um, you know, we only invest in debt on the commercial real estate side. Uh, one of the reasons we, we are relatively risk averse, you know, the kind of the saying within our company is this is stay rich investing, not get rich investing. Um, and from a risk profile, uh, the other thing that we kind of look at or another kind of adage is that, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, liability to owning commercial real estate properties. Um, so the adage is, you know, you can, you can slip and fall on a property, you can't slip and fall on debt. Um, so from our perspective, uh, you know, we look at more the debt side from the commercial real estate perspective, only because there, there are more underlying risks from, from our perspective, more underlying risks to owning commercial real estate property. Got it. Um, uh, by the way, um, if there's any questions, we'll start taking questions shortly. Uh, Brian, so just talking about, because uh, you're, you're a debt investor, so I think this is probably the way you probably think about how you assess um, the deals that you enter, you know, how should people look at these deals? You know, how should they assess it? But, you know, how, how should people think about like what can go wrong in investing in distressed? Yeah. So I guess that would kind of be just an expansion on, on, uh, on the, on the previous answer, whereas you really have to understand the risk profile of that underlying asset. Um, so again, I think if you take the spectrum of commercial real estate and the asset classes, you know, industrial is relatively low, hospitality is relatively high. Mm -hmm. So from, from our perspective in our funds, you know, our, our, our funds and the LPs, they want a decent return, but they want a relatively limited risk. So we don't look at within our, our three primary funds, we don't, we won't do, or we almost never do hospitality. If we were to invest in hospitality, we would want a separate fund with a defined exit strategy where we would partner with a hotel operator or a hotel asset manager uh, that, that you know, we, can, we can discuss, as I said, that, that exit opportunity ahead of time. Uh, and we would launch a fund like that or get into a fund or, or co-investment partnership like that because all of the investors would understand that it is a different risk profile. Whereas right now we stick to what I would say is basically the, the four main food groups of um, commercial real estate, which is industrial, office, retail, and, and multifamily. Um, but as I said, like when we look for deals, we want to uh, get a decent return, but make sure that the, that the risk profile is within our wheelhouse. So we believe that we know how to um, uh, service debt, restructure debt, and work towards payoffs. What we are not particularly, you know, our, our, our core competency is not operating businesses within that real estate. Uh, so that's how we kind of look at the risk profile and, and look at our investment strategy. Great. Hey, Karin, do you want to add anything in terms of the way you look at um, the investment considerations uh, when you're assessing um, your deals? And then we'll move over to questions. Um. Yeah, um, you know, um, when when we're looking at deals, when we're looking for new acquisition opportunities, um, we look at the underlying market, um, the health of the of the market. I would say the biggest driver, though, of uh, for on the acquisition side is the discount. Um, that we're able to purchase the asset for relative to its estimated value, whether that estimated value is based on third party, um, uh, third party sources or BPOs. That really is the biggest driver um, when we're looking at, at, at new acquisition opportunities. Although we do look at 
um, the, the condition of the underlying asset, vacancy rates in the area, um, and, and, and a couple other factors as well that we kind of integrated into um, a, a proprietary analysis software that we've developed. Fantastic. All right, so let's let's move over to questions because we only have a not much time left. Um, so Brandon asks, what are what are you guys seeing in terms of pricing for NPLs in the twenty to fifty million pool size? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to take that. I would say that we're seeing. Um, it, for the twenty to fifty million dollar deal side, actually, th that is what is coming across our desk right now. Very interestingly, um, and we were surprised to see those opportunities coming faster than expected. So, um, again, this is sort of back to what I was saying earlier, where it, it may be the case that some sellers are looking to make space on their balance sheets for what they anticipate might be more defaults. So, what we're seeing is that these pools of um you know several up to up to 50 to 100 million dollars of of npl are coming through and the sellers are are willing even now um before what could be a larger tsunami of of uh foreclosures they're willing to take greater discounts than we've previously seen um the next question um and this is probably right up uh, Brian's alley. Uh, do you offer syndicated investments in commercial debt? Uh, we have done some of that in the past. Uh, you know, on on specific properties, we might do a syndication. Uh, we might do a co-investment on on a particular deal. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, given the structure of our private equity fund. Uh, you know, if there's any sort of conflict of interest, uh, the right of first refusal goes to the LPs and, and the people within that fund. But we have done um, certain deals in the past on a syndicated basis. Right. Um, this is a really interesting question. Um, what factors drive the timeline? You know, how quick, efficient uh, to work out non-performing loans? Uh, factors that drive the timeline? Um, I guess I, I guess I want to make sure I'm sort of answering the question that he's that he's, this person is trying to ask because I guess we look at um, when we do a workout or or any type of refinance we typically refinance for anywhere from from 18 to 36 months um, you know typically if we refinance that loan it would be interest only uh, we try to work with a borrower you know when we purchase the non-performing loan one of the things that we look at when we're doing the due diligence and the analysis is, um, uh, you know, obviously payment ability. Uh, and that can either be the, the business itself or the, uh, you know, the personal financial wherewithal of that borrower. Uh, so all of those things kind of factor into how quickly that workout or the non-performing loan can happen. Uh, but then we also look at the length of time if, if we have to pursue a foreclosure, that is much different than working towards a payoff. And that could potentially add, you know, 24 to 36 months to the timeline of, you know, resolution or liquidating of that investment. Got it. Um, this question is pointed to Karin. Um, knowing PIMCO's proprietary nature, will Pikes provide preferred equity in an all cash deal for a client? Um, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Short and sweet. I love it. Um, are there any more questions? We have a few minutes left. We got four minutes left. Um, okay. Um, so I think I think one of the um, you know from from my world we deal with a lot of funds and investors, um, and then once an investor is interested, it's always you know where do they go. Um, so if kind of how, how can investors access um, these types of, you know, distress opportunities? Um, oh, wait, hold on. Let's take this question. Um, are you guys still seeing credit facilities willing to step in and lever capital for NPL purchases? 
Uh, I could jump in quickly just from my perspective. We are yeah. seeing some. They, they, <laughs> they've definitely taken some time, and there, there was certainly a period, I would say, from, you know, call it late March through May, where it was, you know, I think most bankers were, were simply just trying to uh, get, a, get a grasp on, on, on what was going on in the world and the financial impact. Uh, but we have spoken with bankers recently uh, now that I, I wouldn't say the dust is settled, but I think they at least have their arms around uh, what's in their portfolio, what the bank's risk profile looks like, uh, where we have talked to uh, banks that are either either starting or, or you know offering new credit facilities or you know continue to offer their existing credit facilities. So we have seen some. It, there was definitely there definitely seemed to be a pause. Uh, but I would say that there are some out there that are that are lending against this. Okay, great. Um, we have two minutes left if there's any more questions. Um, I guess that's that's it. Um, okay, um, so I think that's it. Um, so I, I want to thank our panelists and um, Flya uh, for this panel discussion. Um, and uh, I will hand it back to Michael. Um, Amanda, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all, all the panelists uh, for doing an excellent job on such an interesting topic today. Uh, we appreciate your participation in this event. And, um, you know, we'll be sharing a recording of, of this presentation as well as uh, slides. Uh, if you have any particular presentations that you want us to share on the recap and the follow-up, please uh, provide them to our team. And, um, you know, also the best way for people to contact you, that would be great. But uh, thanks, thanks again to, to this panel. It was an ex exceptional job. So with that said, I'm going to take a little bit of time and go through um, you know, my brief notes here. Um, we uh, have been building and growing the organization steadily um, and uh, the, the work, the direction that we're heading in has really shown um, some significant results. Um, so with that said, those results would not be possible uh, without um, our, our sponsors, for the events, our, our members, our, our board, the uh, flyer team, uh, the, the actual audience, the, 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 each participant in the event today, every, all these different pieces of the puzzle um, make everything uh, possible and you know, make it an exceptional event. Um, so I wanna thank Nationwide for sponsoring the event today. Uh, Prequin for sponsoring the event, Boomerang Capital, S&P Global Market Intelligence, Safe Harbor Equity, um, the Mortgage Office, Harvest Volatility Management, Millennium Trust, Apex One Investment Partners, and uh, Entrust Global, Off the Chain Capital, Clarion Asset Management. Um, you know, without your help, this event would not be able to happen. Um, you know, both from a speaking and presenting as well as, uh, you know, from a support and guidance. Um, so we're putting part five of this event together. Um, we should have uh, some sort of uh, agenda for part five. Uh, initially, we were going to do this event live in New York, but because of various rules and regulations uh, for uh, traveling between the tri-state area and Florida and Florida and tri-state area, we decided to uh, move off of those plans to keep part five digital and increase it to two days instead of the one day that we had initially planned. So there's some, some things that we'll talk to you about later today just to, to, sh to discuss and clarify uh, what part five is going to look like. Um, but as, you, as everybody can tell, the, the frank conversation that is going on over, over the past uh, day and a half now, um, which has generated 
um, over a half a million minutes of live watch time um, since we started. Um, it's, it's what the investors want to know. It's what they, they want to hear. And it's, it's because of, it's because of each participant's willingness to, to, to share what's going on during these unprecedented uh, events that people keep coming back and listening uh, to this conversation. So um, anyway, we're appreciative of it from Flya perspective. Uh, we'll be talking more about the special situations marketplace and how to uh, upload your special situation or how to look at special situations. Um, we keep getting a lot of requests for uh, recordings and um, presentation materials. All of that stuff can be found on the Flyer website by going to flaia.org and looking at the recap. Um, the, these two days of content take a while to uh, edit and to put up onto our website. Uh, a wise man once told me that for every minute of recording is um, 20 minutes of editing. So uh, we have six hours yesterday, six hours today of, of content. That content is going to take us a little bit to get back to you, but I, I promise that we'll get it back to you in a very um, nicely edited and presented way. If you want to listen to previous um, previous recaps from part one, two, uh, three, uh, you can check out our website and um, it's all laid out there very nice and neatly. Um, so the organization Flyer, our, our mission and vision is to provide uh, investors and general partners a marketplace to uh, look for and to list um, alternative investment opportunities, um, digital events like our two-day event, Real Estate Direct Lending Private Debt Forum 2020, uh, which we will also, after part five, we'll be taking a little break for the summer and coming back in the end of the third quarter, beginning of the, uh, the whole fourth quarter uh, with our fall season of this same event. Um, but we also do topics on alternative investments and why these topics are, are the right place to, to put capital into and how you should be thinking about these topics. Um, these are some of the upcoming educational webcasts. I've, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing these, uh, these, I've been in the alternative investment space now since uh, 2006. Prior, prior to that, I was with UBS allocating money to all alternative investment managers. What I will say to you is that we have excellent, excellent people. Um, they're sharing their life experiences investing in specific niche strategies. If you have not registered to attend these individual webcasts, these educational webcasts, I strongly suggest you do so. Um, these people are, you know, they're, they're brilliant in, in their particular niches. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I know and I learn from them. 